dann einen wunderschönen guten Abend. Herzlich willkommen, willkommen bei unserem Talk What is Fair? Und je nachdem, ob man den Programm oder den Folien glaubt, Preventing Dystopia by Taking a Long Hard Look at Technology oder auch Tackling Challenges in Modern AI. Uh, I'm going to switch to English now because this talk was announced to be English. So welcome to our talk. Uh, good evening. And I hope we're all going to have fun together. Uh, my name is Nana, and I'm here for the second time at MMCD. Um, I'm a computer science student, and I do some uh, research and some talking and some reading about machine learning, about natural language processing, about diversity in tech, about equality, and some other kind of topics. And I'm not here alone. Hi, I'm uh, Klaas, and I've, start, uh, I've decided to start my experience with uh, chaos events the hard way directly giving a talk, um, because what's the worst thing uh, that could possibly happen? Um, I'm also a student uh, here at uh, TU Darmstadt, mostly focusing on uh, machine learning. And then uh, I also have some interest in uh, uh, cognitive science, philosophy, and uh, general uh, political activism. And yeah. We are going to be talking about the topics of uh, fairness and biases in machine learning. Um, this is our agenda. We've uh, thought that the uh, motto of this year's M MRMCD is um, movies. So uh, the sad thing is this is going to be a dystopian fiction and reality without uh, Jennifer Lawrence shooting with bows at helicopters. So for everybody who uh, wanted to see that kind of dystopia, this is not what we're going to be presenting. But we also have a very nice uh, dystopia uh, to start with, to kind of get you in the mood for what we're going to be talking about. Imagine a world where there is a company, it's called Faceception, and it will make it possible to see whether you or who you are um, on the basis of just one photograph of your face. It can derive personality traits, it can derive lots of things. What this company promises is that it can tell whether you have a high IQ. Okay, that might be interesting. Um, I would like to be told that I have a high IQ. I would probably not like it if somebody told me that the software tells me that I don't have a high IQ. But it also promises to tell whether I'm an academic researcher or a high stakes uh, poker player. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad. But they also promise to tell us whether we're white collar offenders. Okay, I'm not rich enough to be a white collar uh, offender, but this is getting kind of disturbing. Remember, this company promises that it only needs one picture of your face. And they're also looking whether you're a terrorist or a pedophile. At this point, we should probably be thinking about what, what's, what's this company is talking about? I've called this a dystopian fiction. This company is reality. This is an Israeli startup that actually promises those things, that actually has sold those things, at least um, according to their own website, to uh, a national defense agency. Not the national defense agency, but one. And um, so we can reasonably assume that somebody somewhere actually thinks, A, that it is possible to see whether you're a terrorist from this picture of your face, which is probably highly questionable, and B, that it's a good idea. The worst thing about this is that they uh, promise an 80% accuracy, which is kind of not high enough to arrest somebody for terrorism for. I mean, if you imagine a city which has maybe one potential terrorist and they're going to be arresting 20% of the city, that's going to be a lot of people without actually ever finding a terrorist. Um, and obviously this is highly problematic. And what this talk's going to be about, we're going to be talking about this and other systems, and we're going to um, kind of walk you through how there's very, very many problems. Each one of you might be thinking of one right now on very many levels of these systems. 
So now that, that we've established that we're going to be talking about a dystopia, I would like to introduce you uh, to the star of today's movie, movie, which is artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever you want to call it, some kind of uh, intelligence system supported by computers, built by computers, built by humans with computers. And to do this, I would like to lay out some very, very basic steps of the machine learning pipeline because I'm not sure uh, whether everyone here has some kind of, of background with this topic or is familiar with any of it. So I'm going to be introducing the four major steps that will be important for us today. And we're going to start with the real world, with everyday life, with nature, with physics, with chemistry, with everything that we see, with our eyes, that we hear, that we feel, that we taste, that we however otherwise um, register. And this is already part of machine learning. This is already part of artificial intelligence because we can only work with what already exists. We don't create something out of vacuum here. The second step is that we observe something of some form. This can be through technology, this can be through people, this can be through, be through some kind of word, but there is a form of projection here that turns the real world into some kind of observation. Then we introduce our algorithm, or our algorithms, or whatever other kind of model we're going to build and train. And this uses our observation, our data, to learn some form of pattern or several patterns that it's going to be using in the future. And of course, as the fourth step, we're going to want to apply these patterns to something. We're going to want to use what we learned. And we can look at this, we can look at the world, we can look at our data, our algorithm, and the decision-making that is probably going to happen as a consequence of it. And I would like to ask you, as a rhetorical question, to be honest, uh, where humans are involved in this process. And I'm going to be asking myself whether they're involved in the real world, and I'm going to tell you, yes, they are. <laughs> and this is not surprising. But they're also involved in the data that we create, in the observation that we create, create because they created that data and they decided to collect that data and they decided on the form and on the way it's being processed and saved and stored and everything else that's going to happen to it. This is human-made. This does not happen by accident. We never have the entire world in our data. It just doesn't happen. It's always been human decision-making. And the algorithms were designed, were developed, were trained, were parameterized by humans. These were decisions that we made. These were things that we brought into the process. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. And as a result, the entire decision-making process, the entire way the system is going to be used, what decisions are going to be made on top of it, with the results that come out of this, is again, human-made. So we in are an integral part of every step of this pipeline. Now, the title of our talk was, uh, What's Fear? And uh, I want to come back to that because um, there has been a recent trend for a couple of years now that people have been um, calling uh, for some form of a new technology or legislation that makes AI and machine learning fair. Now, fairness is also something that each and every one in this room will probably have a concept of. But we or probably most of the people in the room uh, have some form of computer science background and you know that terms like fairness are kind of vague. Because what's fair? You might assume that the world is fair when everybody's equal, when everybody's just the same and there are no differences, nobody is treated differently, etc. You're also probably a citizen of this world and know that that doesn't really happen right now. This is not a really realistic assumption that we are all going to be completely e equal in every regard. Some of us might be a little bit taller, other might be a little bit shorter. Um, so maybe we go a step back and say, okay, it's fair when everybody has the same chances to achieve something, their dreams, their needs. It's still a little bit vague. Maybe we can narrow this down a little bit more. When everybody has the opportunities they need, because, I mean, if we all have the same chances, I mean, everybody of you is going to get math tutoring now. That's probably useful for some of you, that's probably useless for some others uh, in this room. Everybody gets the same chances now. So when everybody has the opportunities they need, 
okay, opportunities are nice, but am I actually going to be in a position where I can uh, make use of those opportunities? We can go further and say, um, first, when everybody's needs are satisfied, I mean, at this point, you're starting to see a pattern. All, we're trying to define this term, and we're using other vague terms, and all of these definitions are kind of the same, different, and those are not even all the definitions uh, I could come up with, or I can came up with, uh, and I'm not even a philosopher or a sociologist who has actually thought deeply about this topic. I mean, some people might claim that we can only reach fairness when capitalism is abolished because our system is inherently unfair. There's also a stance you can take. All of this might seem like philosophical bullshitting now, but um, if we want our algorithms to be fair and to make fair decisions, we will have to, at some points, decide what fair means for us. And I'm not espousing that any of those definitions which I came up uh, with uh, yesterday and today are the definition of fairness, but I think they all show that that term is very multifaceted. All right. I would like to take you through a thought experiment now because I kind of uh, think this is going to bring us where we want to go in this talk. And I'm just going to say that we assume right now we have every knowledge there is to have about machine learning, that we know everything we need to know about artificial intelligence, that we know the choices, that we know the ways to do it, that we have the perfect idea of what might fit a question or what opportunities we have. And I'm also going to suppose that we have answered the question, what is fair? that we have a very concrete idea that we consider to be correct of this question, which is very multifaceted, as we've heard. And we're going to move forward a step, because now that we have the background knowledge, we want to do something with it. So what we need is an objective. We need to have a place in mind where we want to go, what we want to do, what we want to build, uh, to start getting there. So what we need is a goal. And we're going to start with a very abstract level, it's not about picking a topic, it's not about picking a concrete everyday problem, but first of all, the idea of what my intelligence system is going to want to accomplish. And some people say that a machine learning system should make perfect predictions. I would like to challenge that assumption, because A, what is perfect? Is there always a perfect prediction? And B, can we really predict the future? Predictions are always about things that haven't happened yet, things that we don't know, things that are somewhere far ahead in time. And the question is, can computers do what humans can't possibly do? Take everything into account, foresee what is going to happen, what chances will occur, what decisions will be made. Is that a sensible thing to ask of a system that humans have built when they have no idea how to do this? I personally would say, probably not. So the next idea is to make uh, interpolations. We have some data, we have some observations, we have things that have happened in the past, and we can take them, and we can project them, and do some kind of statistical finding of what is probable. And this, in very many people's mind, is what statistics does, and machine learning has a huge part of it that is basically statistics. And we're going to take this assumption as something we might be able to do. But is this what we are doing? Is this really why companies have research and development centers focused on AI? Why DeepMind exists? Why artificial intelligence has been the buzzwords in some of the past years? I'm going to say probably not, or at least not for all of them. Because especially companies have a tendency that they do want to make money. So we have the possibility that an algorithm should maybe just make the most profit. There are certainly some people that would make very, very happy. But is that what we want? Is that where we're going with our future, with this kind of intelligent meta system that everybody, everyone has hyped up to be some kind of ultimate goal? What we are asking in this talk is the question whether maybe, just maybe, an algorithm should be fair. And we've seen that fairness is a kind of complicated argument. But as I said before, we're going to suppose we know what fair is and we're going to set our goal for our algorithm to be fair. And we might just lose some other things on the way. Now, um, some of people in this room um, might be uh, bored at this point, because this is all philosophical 
word play, basically what we've been doing. So I got out and looked for a real example, and I found this really nice tool um, built by some uh, Google research scholars. Uh, I have the link to it at the end. You can play around with it and s uh, see for yourself what happens. It's really a lot of fun. They try to um, propose a theory of what fair AI is. And um, they made different kind of, they, they took uh, basically what I did earlier, they took different notions of fairness and tried to, tried to run a basic algorithm through it and see what happens. So the scenario here is um, loan, uh, loan strategies based on loan scores. So all of you are probably familiar with things like the Shufa, which calculates a score from lots of data about you. And then based on that, a uh, company might decide whether to give you money or not. And uh, they first uh, assume two populations, blue and orange, to kind of um, kind of make it a little bit abstract from real world issues, and just uh, try to maximize the profit of a company which gives the loans um, based on these populations that we have. So the light gray dots are the people who are not going to pay back the loan, and the um, sort of more colorful dots of the people who are going to pay back the loan. And what you see is um, this maximizes the profit, uh, but the blue population has a different score on which it is uh, evaluated than the orange population. This might be optimal, but uh, some of you might already have some kind of uh, idea of what these uh, populations could represent in real life. Be it gender, be it ethnicity, be it something, we probably don't really want that. So they went further and said, okay, if we don't want to uh, differentiate between those groups, we can just go for a group unaware basing. That should be fair, right? Everybody's held to the same standards with the same score, etc. Should be fair. You can see um, the loan threshold is the same, but what's now happening is if you're part of the blue population and you're one of the people who's going to pay back your loan, uh, you have an 81% chance of being accepted. And if you're part of the orange population, you have a 60% chance of getting that loan. So even though we're not differentiating between those groups, something in those groups, of course it's the distribution of uh, the people in it, um, pre or lowers the chances that we're getting a loan. And this also kind of seems unfair because we might not really want those real world biases to influence us based on these groups. So one other thing we might um, strive for is to have a group parity so that both, um, uh, that both parties are represented equally in the people that are getting the loan. So the positive rate of the two populations is equal. Um, this is, for example, what you're going to do if you quotate a list. So if you say half of the list is going to be males, half of the list is going to be females. Um, it might be what you want to do. Um, the problem here is, of course, that you have different loan thresholds again. So people are going to be treated differently based on their group. And you also have um, now somebody from the blue population who is going to pay back their loan actually has a lower chance than somebody from the yellow population to get it. So what the people in this paper argue for that the fairest way to do this is to balance the pr true positive rate. So that both group, uh, assuming you are somebody who's going to pay back their loan, um, you should have an equal chance of getting that loan, no matter from which population are. Now I've talked about fairness earlier. I would kind of challenge the authors on saying this is the gold standard for fairness, because as I've um, elaborated upon, that kind of very much depends on what you assume is fair and what your actual goals are. But this example really shows these four ways of doing it. I mean, there are lots more. Uh, if you go to the website, you can play around with those sliders. Um, those four ways are already perfectly valid uh, things to consider. And so when building an algorithm, we will need to consider them. The problem is we have been... Um, kind of assuming that these scores that are underlying this decision are calculated in a fair and unbiased ways. And I think Nana is going to tell us something about that. Am I? No, actually, of course I am. Because now that we've already thought about in our experiment uh, what fairness is and what machine learning is, and we know what our goal is, 
we're going to have to talk about what our algorithm is going to work with. And I've introduced the four set machine learning pipeline earlier. And I've told you that it's very abstract and it's of course not the only model that describes machine learning in any way, because there are some things um, that work di differently, but we're going to be concentrating on a very large group of machine learning and AI systems. And those are the ones that are based on data. So I'm going to want to talk about the data that we base our models on. And I'm going to want to give you a content warning now because the examples that are coming up are not only extremely racist, but there's also some Holocaust denial in there. And I hope that um, if you don't want to be confronted with that right now, you have the possibility to just maybe skip ahead in the video or uh, distract yourself some way for the next few minutes. This example, which we took from Twitter, has gone through the news several times already, but I'm not sure if everyone has seen it. So I'm just going to uh, shortly explain it. Google Photos has the ability to categorize your pictures and to label them. So it puts them in categories and it tries to detect on what you photographed or what you saved pictures on and it gives it a name. And what happened here is that we don't only have airplanes and skyscrapers and cars and stuff, but we also have a picture of two uh, people of color here which was labeled gorillas. And I'm honestly hoping that I don't have to explain in too many words why this is highly problematic and definitely racist in a way. And this is something that should not uh, happen to us. It should not be something that people have to deal with. And it's something that Google should not have put out there. They should have detected that. They should have dealt with it. And by now they did deal with it, but it still happened and it still affected people. And they were confronted with this. The other example, it's also from Twitter. And this is a bot that was created by Microsoft and that was supposed to go out in the internet and learn how people talk to each other and how they have conversations and how they use language and then imitate a person writing. And it did. But there was something they didn't take into account, namely that the internet is a very large place and there's very many different people on there and not everything that this algorithm or this system or this bot would encounter is something that you want to reproduce. This, for example, is something that you definitely don't want to reproduce. It's something that you definitely don't want to put out there. And there are racist people in the internet. There are sexist people in the internet. There are people with all sorts of biases and flaws and lies and everything out there. And once intelligent systems start to copy this kind of behavior, they adopt these biases, they adopt these flaws, they adopt these problems. Because as we've seen before, humans are always involved, especially when they produce the data that you're going to feed to your system. Because where do we get our data from? We get it from the world. And this world that we're modeling from is a flawed world. There are problems there, there are biases, there are unfairness situations, unfair situations, there are all kinds of things um, that produce flaws. It's a world that we have interpreted. We can't just take the entire world and put it in a computer. It doesn't work that way. There's always interpretation going on. There's always human influence. And people have different strategies and different objectives and different goals and different ideas. We're not always of the same opinion. And this produces the same kind of problems as people who have known or unknown biases. People who might be obviously sexist and people who might have more subtle things that are being researched in psychology or in sociology where they don't make objective decisions. We're not perfect in that way. We're not objective and we're not all the same. So it always depends on who does what. So we're going to look at our system and we're going to stick with the loan example. So we're going to do credit scoring. And we're at the step of creating our data, of selecting our data and collecting our data. And what we've done is we asked a lot of people about their education, previous loans they've had and whether they pay them back, their zip codes or their address basically, their income and their ethnicity. Can I ask you who sees a problem with that list? There's a few hands up there. There's some hands not up there, I get both. And I'm sure that not everyone who put their hand up sees the same problem. Um, the problem I'm going to suggest is there might be someone of Latino descent 
and just because of their ethnicity, the algorithm might decide they're not worthy of a loan. But this says nothing about this individual in, in particular. They might still have enough possibilities to pay back. They might still be responsible. They might still have all the attributes that you want from a person you lend money to. So to solve this problem, to eliminate the racism that you can see in the system, what can we do? The obvious solution is we take out ethnicity. We just take it out of the equation, we delete the data, we don't put it into the algorithm anymore. Is this a fix? Are we safe now? I seriously doubt it. Because statistics and mathematics and machine learning all come together somewhere, and most machine learning, problem, uh, uh, most machine learning systems rely on the same assumption. They rely on the assumption that all attributes are statistically independent from each other. And this just doesn't necessarily hold in the real world. So an independent variable would look something like this. We have an x and a y axis, and we can't tell if one gets larger or smaller what happens to the other. It's just random, basically. But a variable might also look something like this that we can, in fact, tell from X something about what might possibly happen to Y. There is a statistical dependency. And when we go back to our list of attributes, we now have to think about whether there are dependencies between the uh, attributes that we have eliminated and the att attributes we're still using. And that is, in fact, the case, statistically speaking, because ethnicity in our society, in our flawed and biased and sometimes racist society, um, there are statistical connections between ethnicity and income, between ethnicity and education, and especially between ethnicity and zip code, which might be one of the more obvious choices, because there are neighborhoods and places in the world where there's just statistical differences in how many people of what descent live there. So what our computer might just do, and this has happened plenty of times, is that they extract from the other attributes the exact information that we didn't want it to use. And these kind of proxy attributes or proxy features must not be forgotten when we're trying to defend ourselves from biases. So, um, at this point, you might be thinking, and that's probably a correct thought, if we fix our data. So all of these were examples where our data was flawed in some way. The, um, Google algorithm was not correctly um, evaluated on uh, people of color. The Microsoft bot was not uh, resistant enough uh, towards uh, noisy and unwanted data. The uh, zip code or the um, credit scoring uh, uh, example, you could fix that with uh, decorrelation algorithms, etc. This is a good way to go. But I'm going to suggest even if we do that, we're not going to solve the issue entirely. Um, because we still have to go back to that point where we are thinking about the algorithm's goals. And I hope this uh, point will get clear. Um, but first, I want to give a quote by uh, this philosopher here. I included the picture mostly because I thought he looked really funny, but I mostly thought that uh, yesterday I was really tired. And that guy um, had a similar problem a couple of hundred years ago. He um, was looking at moral philosophers, so people who went out in the world and constructed theories of what's right and wrong, what's good and bad. And um, he basically said, okay, I looked at everything they've written, and most of those people at some point say, um, sheep eat, uh, wolves eat sheep, so it is good that wolves eat sheep. And that's a kind of fallacy, and this is called the is-ought problem. Um, my, my pointer really doesn't work well anymore. Um, the is-ought problem basically states only because something is the way it is in the real world, it's not necessarily supposed to be that way, because obviously there is a lot of income inequality, for example, uh, here and in the Americas uh, between um, white and pe uh, people of color. This is not the way it ought to be. It is the way it is. And I'm going to ask the question, aren't our algorithms very much prone to committing the same or a very similar fallacy? And I want to make that point on something that's also garnered a lot of attention in the last few years. 
predictive policing. Predictive policing is a um, pretty well-known tool, uh, has been a well-known tool for a long time. It's gotten a lot of additional attention because the algorithms for it got better. It's basically um, a police department is going to look at the map of a city and is going to say, okay, in these neighborhoods we observed far higher crime rates under these and these circumstances. For example, in some neighborhoods crimes are more likely to happen in the early evening, in others in the late evening, in some in the winter, in some in the summer, and so on. And based on that, we are going to calculate how many policemen we need in that area. Seems like a very rational thought. But what's the um, what's like the uh, the thing that has to happen before a crime is reported? There has to be a policeman there who observes a crime or somebody else who tells the police. So what the ACLU has found is that um, what these predictive algorithms actually observe very much is um, in areas where there is a lot of police, they're going to predict a lot of police. There is going to be a lot of crimes um, directly seen there because there are a lot of policemen there. But it goes even deeper than that. A well-known, uh, well many studies actually, a well-known phenomenon that has uh, mostly been observed in, or I know it from New York, is that neighborhoods which are over-policed are actually going to develop crime because the people there are uh, going to be, uh, first of all, thinking that there is more crime, because if you see more policemen out there in the streets, you're going to think, oh man, this is a criminal neighborhood, and the whole, the whole social tension in the neighborhood rises, because people are going to feel under the suspicion, they're going to be um, angry, they're going to be uh, felt like they're uh, observed too much. And so in a way, if you just don't think about this anymore and just send the police what the algorithm is telling you to send police, you're probably even going to create crime if you don't consciously steer against that. And I think this is one of the most um, extreme examples of how algorithms can reinforce what is in nature by predicting that it's always going to be that way. And we, in believing this prediction, are going to be conforming to it, in a way. Now, um, at this point, um, you might ask, uh, can we prevent this? Are we doomed now? Yeah. I mean, we're doomed. All of this is happening. I mean, all of these things that we showed you are not fiction, they're reality. Some haven't really been implemented on wide scale, some have. I suggest we basically switch off the internet, uh, disconnect our computers, and go back to living in caves, because once AI takes over, uh, we're finished. I'm going to say, no, we're not doomed yet. We're going down a path at the time, at the current time, that is probably leading somewhere dark, that it certainly has many pitfalls, that has a lot of problems, some of which we've shown you today but it's still just a path. We're still not there yet. And there's still plenty of ways that we can do something, provided that we actually do something to get there. And to tell you about this, I've brought someone with me, and her name is Cathy O'Neill. She's a mathematician, and she's the author of the book uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. And she has a message for basically every person in this world. And the first part of it goes to the data scientists out there, to everyone who's kind of in big data or machine learning or artificial intelligence or any of these disciplines. And she says, we should not be the arbiters of truth. We should be translators of ethical discussions that happen in larger society. And what she means by that is that, first of all, just because we have the technological uh, knowledge, just because we are the people building these systems that are going to change or are going to shape our future just because we're the ones at the keyboard. We're not the people who get to make the decisions. It's not our right and it's not our competence to decide on ethical, philosophical, societal questions just because we're the one building systems that might be influenced by them. But the second part of the message is that just because we're computer scientists or technologists or any kind of people involved with that, it's not like we can say, well, then it's none of our business. We're just coding. We're just doing what other people are telling us. That's not how it works. Because these questions influence 
our work and they influence our decisions and we are part of society. We have a responsibility toward the rest of society and towards ourselves that we influence and shape and do these discussions and that then we kind of combine the two worlds. We combine the discussions we have in society and the conclusions we reach and the things we want to try with the technological side that is going to influence everyday life of so many people. And we have to, to be that bridge because no one else can be. And we are part of this whole discussion. And I've said that she has a message for basically everyone. And this was just for the data scientists. So here comes for the non-data scientists. This is not a math test. This is a political fight. We need to demand accountability for our algorithmic overlords. And what that means is that just because someone is not technologically interested or someone is not a data scientist or is not building intelligent systems, that doesn't mean that they're out of it. That doesn't mean that it doesn't impact them at all. And that doesn't mean that I don't have any responsibility toward this whole issue. Because this is a discussion that we need to have. This is something we need to demand from governments and from people in positions of power and from people working in large companies or in society um, that are making decisions for us and that are doing things that will impact our entire lives and our future. And we need to demand that there's some kind of fairness, some kind of accessibility, some kind of transparency, some kind of accountability. And we need to enforce that this is somehow being put into rules and into ideas and into system and into our sense of what is right and integrated in our everyday life. So what can we actually do? Most importantly, we can start asking questions to ourselves, to others who build these systems, to this whole kind of subject. I mean, you've done the first step, you're here listening to us, so there's probably some kind of low-level interest, maybe high-level interest, I don't know. I would like to find out, to be honest. But we have to keep asking questions. And when we're talking about intelligent system, I think there's basically three big questions that we have to ask. The first one would be, who is building these systems? Who is designing these systems? Who is making them? Who are these people? And the problem that I see in tech is that too many of them are built by these stereotypical cis, hetero, male, white, young, able-bodied, guy in Silicon Valley somewhere? And is this our society? Is this representative? Can that work if people don't have the background or the knowledge from any other part of society that they build systems that influence all of us? I don't think so. I think we need more diversity in this world and more diversity in the people who make these decisions and design these systems. And the second question is, once we have the people, how are they doing it? Are they working? with a scientific method? Are they working methodologically unflawed? Are they making rational decisions? Are they basing their stuff on something? Is this working? Are they overlooking things? Are they potentially hiding things intentionally to propagate their own propaganda, to propagate their own objectives? And we need to look at this because all of these flaws, whether intentional or not, can impact discrimination, can impact everyday life, can impact, impact ethics. And the third question then, is why are they doing it? What are they doing it for? What's their goal? What's their objective? And not just the one that's written on the outside of the box, but also the one they had in mind when they created this. Is the goal profit? Is the goal doing something good? That's a huge difference. Can you do both? In some cases, probably. Pretty much definitely, but not always. What were they planning to do? And what did the computer actually do? There's sometimes a difference. So that's why we have to ask questions and why we have to be attentive when it comes to things that many people in the world don't entirely understand. Because the whole idea that computers are objective and always right and ethically unflawed doesn't work that way. We can't blindly trust in computers and algorithms. So, um, before we wrap up, these are sources in a, especially for everybody who's interested. Um, I don't have that here. Ah, yeah. Um, uh, I suggest you pl play around with the, uh, with the Google uh, research thing. It's the third item on the list. It's a lot of fun. If you like, uh, if you like flashy stuff. And uh, those are the picture sources. And then we have some more uh, general sources um, where you can look up more in that uh, topic. First of all, the probably most scientific and uh, um, Branded resource, if you don't only want to listen to us two talking here, um, is the ACM FAT. 
and they're the ACM group for fairness, accountability, and transparency in machines and algorithms. And they have lots of resources. They organize conferences. They organize workshops. It's definitely worth taking a look. Um, also, this is kind of related in a little bit different way. I listened to a really great talk at the 34th C3, uh, which was called Social Cooling. It was about how um, scoring algorithms, basically like the Chinese scoring systems, can kind of do that, which I kind of described with the predictive policing. They can reinforce the behavior we're observing right now in the world as correct and basically freeze the society by uh, making it really hard to change in a large scale how we act and how we want to interact with each other. Um, the Algorithm Justice League is um, not, a, not a group of, or not only a group of uh, established professors, but they're um, more of a grassroots uh, movement who also have a lot of resources um, on many, many uh, things or uh, topics which intersect with uh, algorithmic uh, fairness and justice and accountability. And then there are lots of uh, other talks, for example, by the mentioned Kathy O'Neill, uh, TED Talks, other talks, which uh, are on, on each and every level of their topics. So some of them are really high level, a little bit like ours. Others go more in depth into the uh, system. If you want, you can probably uh, spend the next two weeks just listening to talks. I don't know if you want to do that, but it's definitely possible and certainly interesting. <laughs> or if uh, you're not uh, going to spend the next two weeks researching on this topic on yourself, you could just ask us some questions. We spoke too long. Thank you very much for listening. We're open for any further questions. <laughs>